Being a do-it-all person means you know how to get stuff done, but it often comes at the expense of other things or people, yourself included. Welcome to Health, Harmony, and Happiness with Kathy. I'm your host, Kathy Stricker. I'm a state patrol wife, mama to three lively kiddos, a yoga teacher, certified NLP coach, and an energetic rhythms expert. As an energetic rhythms coach, I help action-taking women use their body's rhythms and the moon's cycle to optimize productivity and avoid burnout without letting their desire to remain in control alter their focus. And this podcast is all about doing just that and perhaps a bit more so that you can create your own path to health, harmony, and happiness. So come along with me and may this episode serve as a nudge to discover tools that could help you on your path towards more intentional living. Enjoy the show. Hey friends, welcome to episode 66 of the podcast. I am so grateful that you are here. Glad to be back. Sorry about last week. You know when we have the best of intentions and the best plans and they just go south. That is exactly what happened. But alas, my family is all healthy. We are well. I am back at the show, excited to be doing it. And I have a phenomenal guest here for you today. And I'm excited for you to meet her. This episode is a little bit longer but stick with me to the end or break it up into smaller bite-sized chunks because it is so worth it. I am grateful to have my coach, Deb Blum, here and visiting all about your do-it-all nature. If you haven't been in that community, this is your nudge because this episode is brought to you by the Energetic Rhythms for Intentional Living Facebook community. It's the community that I run where we talk about all things energetic rhythms and how to be intentional in using your energetic rhythms. Head over to the show notes to grab the direct link to check out that community. I'd love to see you in there. Deb Lum is the founder and guide for The Whole Soul Way. Having been an empowerment and transformational coach for women for over a decade, she's pulled together everything she's learned on her own path and from her clients into a guided self-paced online course and program. In her program, she teaches a step-by-step process to unhook from fear, conditioning, and other barriers to love so that you can truly enjoy the life you're in and experience emotionally deep and mutually fulfilling relationships. And friends, I can tell you that that is absolutely what happens. That's absolutely what happened to me in her program. And I've just just kind of wrapped up the program at the end of 2022. And I'm continuing on with coaching with Deb. And she's a beautiful inspiration. And I look forward to always getting to learn from her. So, um, So I'm excited to share her with you all. Deb's the mom of 18 and 20-year-old boys and lives with her husband of 21 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it seems to me that I find, I just realized in reading that, many of my teachers from California. So I am so glad to have the power of the internet to connect and the power of Zoom to connect with people. Um, And Deb, I'm grateful that you are here today. So welcome. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Good, good. As I said in the intro, I just finished up the whole Soul Away program. Well, I can't say finished, friends, because it's not like it ever really ends. We just finished in this one container of meeting for a set number of weeks. And now I am going to learn from Deb for my life, I've decided. So so I get to continue on and um, get to have her in my life. But Before we talk about what we're really talking about today, which is uh, what's behind your do-it-all nature and your desire to always be doing, I want to share with you just a tiny bit about this whole Soul Way program that I did. But it was not even like something I ever planned to do, at least at this point in my life. I knew when I first met Deb, because I met Deb through another um, like business peer-to-peer group that we're a part of. And we have a shared mentor or coach that we work with as well. And I met her and I knew right away, like, she's definitely somebody I'm going to work with at some point in my life. And the first time I got on a call with her, I knew that. 
And maybe at that point, it wasn't the right time for me for various reasons, but I got a hold of her this summer about something else and we started chatting. It wasn't even to even learn about her program, which I knew she had because I've seen her business stuff and she has very similar audience to, um, to you guys. But it turns out that at that point in my life, what I needed most was actually what she was <laughs> getting ready to launch with her whole soul way program that was going to be starting in the fall. I've been doing inner child work for years and I've taught many people inner child work. I've worked with them on it. Um, I've helped people learn about this concept of the inner child. But I have to confess that I was not always consistent with working with my inner child. I would do it for a while and then drop off and do it for a while and drop off. And I could be wrong in saying that I feel like I have finally found this system for myself or this this way of connecting with my inner child that um, actually is going to work. And it it is in part due to the work that I did with Deb um, because that connection then has helped me go back and begin to heal some of the childhood gunk that I've been holding on to. Some of the stuff that I didn't even know was there, some that I did have an idea that was there. It helped me um, separate and differentiate my inner child from my ego. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today too, because ego sometimes gets a bad rap and, and we have certain perspectives and perceptions about ego, but really there are some positives and, and it's just another part of us and we need to honor it. Um, so Deb is an incredible person and let's just get, get into this episode, I guess. And thank you so much, Deb, for being here and, and taking the time to share your wisdom with my listeners. Thank you. And thank you for those amazing words of affirmation about the program. And I'm most just excited and thrilled that you've had that experience. You know, it's like, I know that that's the experience people get from the program, but it, it still never ceases to amaze me when I hear the women who go through the program actually share what their experience has been. So that makes me so happy. Good. Good. Well, it is definitely life-changing. And I'll tell you what, it is like inspired change in so many other areas of my life too. And I know you know that because you know me very intimately by now with my emotional and um, mental and spiritual health. And I'm grateful for that, but it has, it has, uh, it's improved my outlook on so many things. There's always work to be done, friends. Always work to be done. Even after you've been doing this work for 10, 20, 30 years, there's always, always, always work to be done on um, generating this higher version of yourself, this, this um, elevated version of yourself so that you bring this kinder, more loving presence to the world around you. So I'll tell you what, it has just been a blessing. It has changed my marriage which is a huge thing. Um, it has changed my relationship with my kids. It has changed my relationship with myself. It has changed my relationship with anger. It has changed my relationship with everything. So mm. thank you. Mm. Beautiful. Yes. And you know what you just said, first of all, yes, it is a lifelong journey. You know, I mean, I don't know, maybe there'll be a point where it's not, I don't, I don't know. Cause I'm not there because I'm consistently finding new things. And I think what you're talking about is one of the things the whole soul way does is I think it gives us a process to work through those things, a like a container to work through those things where usually what we feel like is, oh, this thing is up and it's uncomfortable and I don't know how to deal with it. And I'm just going to like, oh, well, I'll just do some breathing and I'll just do this. And instead of feeling like, okay, I've got an actual process to do it. And um, yeah, so I'm right there with you. And I think that that's one of the things that most people I think I started to appreciate that our, our leaders in these spaces, the things that you and I do with women, it's not about, um, we're beyond it, right? Like you and I aren't saying we're beyond it. We're walking the path with you. We just might be a couple steps ahead, but we're not, we're not saying to you, we're not saying to anybody, oh, we've arrived. And when you get here, it's going to look this way. <laughs> it's right. a constant journey right. and it's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> We're all walking each other home. 
That's true. That is true. I like to use the analogy of just shining a flashlight six feet in front of you. And I use that all the time in helping myself stay focused and helping my clients stay focused on what's next and not like getting too far into the what ifs and what could happen. But it's the same thing that we do for our clients is we're just being that flashlight. We're just maybe a little bit ahead and have a little bit more that we can share with them um, to, to bring them along on their journey. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and truth be told, my clients teach me as well. Uh, for so. sure. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. There's not a day that I meet with someone that I don't walk away being like, Oh, look at, and now I can look at this like this because he just taught me that, or she just taught me that. So exactly. yeah, exactly. it's, it's a humbling experience. It's a humbling for experience. sure. This whole journey is it definitely is. Yeah. So today we're talking about what's behind your do it all nature. And Deb, you're kind of like me. We are people who have been working on unwinding, undoing all of the doing that we've been doing, right? Like <laughs> undoing all of the work that we've done to try to do everything and be amazing and be the best that we can be at whatever it is may fall in our laps. Um, and I think that's the challenge for a lot of people out there. I know it's the challenge for a lot of people out there. We may just not realize that we need to do that. Yeah. Why would we want to do that? Mm. I don't know. I mean, why do we want to undo our doing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean... I'm, I'm guessing you have a bunch of ideas, but I, I think from my personal experience, um, I think when we do, to, when we do a lot, which I'm going to, I'm going to stretch into do too much, kind of, we're doing too much. We're often breeding resentment in our lives because we feel like we're the ones that do it all. We carry everything. We're the ones that are having to think of everything. And so we, we end up feeling contempt for other people that, you know, say for example, our partner, like we're like, ah, oh, you know, why, why doesn't he step up? Why doesn't he do what he's you know supposed to be doing? Could be in the workplace. It could be anywhere. And it's actually a, like a mistaken belief that it's actually more noble <laughs> to be always doing. But, but I know I feel, I, I felt that way. And probably to this day still carry some of that, like, well, I can get everything done. I can do it all. I can do it all. But you know, when I realized that it was actually a coping mechanism for me and that it was a way that I compensated and that I stayed safe in the world, you know, I didn't think I could depend on other people. I didn't trust that other people would show up for me or they would do it the way that I felt that I needed it done. So when I learned that it was more of a coping mechanism than it was actually the noble thing that I thought it was, I started to be able to have more compassion for myself and realize that I was kind of doing it to myself. You know, I was exhausting myself. I, I, and the, the easier path was really to go to the place of, well, why do I do this? Why do I do it? Why do I feel like I need to always do it all and control things and make sure it's done the right way? And, you know, and why can't I let people help me? Why can't I? Why can't I ask for help? I, I, I didn't even think like someone would say, if someone said to me like, well, why don't you ask for help? I would be like, what, what, what do I need? I don't need anything. You know, like I genuinely felt that like yeah. I was the only one I could rely on. So, <laughs> and that's and like, think how much suffering we create in our lives because of that, or because of just putting the idea that someone's not pulling their weight out there into the universe. Like we put that out there, but like, they don't know that we're thinking that. And it's only turned on us that is creating this ugh, yuckiness inside of us, this, this discord. And that creates energy. And then I could go down that rabbit hole of like, we could easily like that energy deciding that stops then you from actually being able to work with that person or having this, having the love exchange go through no matter what that looks like, whether it's your partner, whether it's your children, whether it's the person across the street that works in the store, 
when you put this negative thought in your mind about them, it puts up a wall, it puts up a blockage and it creates resistance that neither of you can go through. Exactly. And I really believe that if you're talking on the energetic level, at some level, they know it. They feel oh, it for sure. Right? They feel it, right. So they might not know it and they, you might not have articulated it to them, but they feel it. And it's, um, it's exactly what you said. It's like a barrier to being able to connect. It's a barrier to loving and, and giving and receiving love, right? It's that right. energetic pathway. It's a barrier to that energetic pathway. And I say love, and I used that word specifically because that's all that we're really trying to do in life. I mean, it, if it, it comes down to it. It's like, how can we create loving relationships? Not necessarily to be in love, but loving kindness towards each other, towards the world. And if we did that, like life would be good, right? It would be. A <laughs> we like to thing. think. I mean, my, my affirmation most days is I am love. Like I am love. I am the source of love. I am. And you know, it's interesting. It's the paradox of this work though. And I was thinking about this this morning that when, before we do this, before we do this inner work, right. To just to be like removing these barriers to love and the blockages and all that we're unconsciously living, right. We're living in this way where we're, we're usually playing out these old patterns from our childhood, these protective patterns. We're usually using coping mechanisms and there is nothing wrong with that. I'm not in judgment of that because that's part of the journey. That's part of the journey. But ultimately where we're trying to get to, often when we're doing that, we're trying, we're, we're outwardly trying to love other people. We're helping, we're taking care of people. We're doing all this stuff, right? Outwardly, we're doing that. But inwardly, we might feel contempt. We might be criticizing. We might be feeling lack. We might feel like we're not loved. We're not appreciated. We aren't seen and we're not known and we're not understood. So we have all this stuff, this like quagmire stuff going on. And then, but we want to be as a person who's like, let's just say even like, I'd even like take a stretch of saying like in selfless service, a person who can love without any, without guarding, who can receive and give love, who can just be spilling over with love, right? But in between, there's this gap, right? And we have the, this is the paradox is you actually have to turn inward and, yeah. and be really like fulfilling your own needs and really going in and healing your childhood stuff. And so there's this period in between where you really are kind of like, you're, you are really self, you're, you're centering in self, but that's not the end game. The end game isn't to be centered in self. The end game is, as you said, it's to love. Right. Be able to share, to, 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 to really experience, be, share, receive love. Totally. And, you know, I think it's funny because I made the commitment or I had made the statement to you at one point in, in our, in the program, how like, I'm just going to focus on, and we had talked about this, like, this is maybe the best time for me to just focus on healing myself and doing the work of myself. And, um, and like really going inward. And then like God said, ha ha, you think you can do that, but not really. You also have to heal your relationship with your husband at the same time. And that was super hard for me. That was super, super hard. And it's, we're still on the journey. I'm still on the journey of doing both, but I had gotten, it was like almost the universe said, God said, okay, but you have enough resources right now that you know what you need to do to do this work on yourself. And I have faith in you that you can also extend that outward to this other relationship that you have said that you loved, just like you said, like we try to love these people and, and things, and then ugh, it gets all jumbled and, and icky sometimes. And we have to go back and like revisit ourselves and, and get back to ourselves. Then we get to start to do that healing work to mend the relationships, to repair the things so that we can go to the other end and actually truly be putting love out there into the world. Yeah. You know, it's so fascinating. So I too went through my journey while raising children and I've had people say to me, well, shouldn't I just wait till my kids are older? Like it's a lot to take on. I'm busy. 
And I always think, oh, but it's the perfect opportunity because by the way, you know, hello, anyone who has children and, and, you know, a husband <laughs> knows that they give us a lot of fodder for our growth. <laughs> so, yeah. We get yeah. Opportunities. <laughs> so we get all kinds of opportunities. They also benefit hugely from it. They benefit, they change. So we don't wait to change and, you know, do the work later. We do the work in the midst of the container of our family and everybody benefits from it. And like, it's so said, amazing. Yeah. That's so amazing. And you're exactly right. And I remember you saying something about, um, changing, I know I'm going to mess this up, but basically changing the way your children experience life somehow, or it's like changing, healing them. That's what it was healing them while you're healing yourself. So healing their future because of the work that you're doing on yourself. Yeah. And it naturally, I've had this conversation with numerous people over the years, like it naturally just happens when you start to do that work on yourself, the people around you feel the energy and they, they start to, um, also, I don't know, be elevated or they also start to their response to life starts to change. Yeah. And that's where I think we get into energy because, you know, it's like, there's, there's something like what it's like nothing, you know, when they talk about like a butterfly flaps its wings here and it changes things across the world. Well, it's like, because it's all, we're all interconnected at some level. So naturally, if something shifts some one level, then uh, it's going to change another person or another experience, or I don't know, possibly nature itself. I don't, I don't know, but yeah. It's such an amazing concept. And that concept of interconnectedness, man, I've used that in and out of messaging over the years. And I've been told so many times that like, that just doesn't make sense. You can't use that. You don't, people aren't going to get that. People don't get that interconnectedness stuff. I don't, what does that even mean? And I'm like, exactly what you just said. A butterfly flaps its wings here and it changes something across the world. Like we're literally all connected, literally all connected energetically in some way. Yeah. I mean, and I like to use this example though. Anyone who, who pushes up against it, I say, well, when you walk into a room and someone is angry and do you feel it when you walk in? Like you could maybe not even look at them. You could just feel the energy of anger mm-hmm. in the room. It's the same thing when you walk in somewhere where there's a lot of, like if, if there's a lot of peace, you know, there are people are just really centered. You, you're you like, whoa, that feels really good. And so, you know, if nothing else, it's just that we feel each other and what are like, say, say emotions, right? It's like energy in motion, right? So yeah, it's hard. I I understand it though if you're looking at it on a more practical level because we look like these separate beings and we look like these, you know, like we and then we're kind of like, well, I do me and you do you, you know, that kind of thing. But that gets into the ego piece, right? Cuz ego consciousness is really all about separateness. Yeah. That's what it is. It's and it's about self-protection and it's about um survival. It's not a bad thing. It's just that eventually we might need to go beyond that. We're we're more than that. We are that and we are more than that. Yeah. So I think so often people think of ego as um, this like puffed up chest kind of person and like, I am so good and, and really only thinking of yourself, yeah. only thinking of, um, and that's more of a self-centered or a selfish approach, but that's in people's minds, I think what happens when we first think of ego and when we learn about ego, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more then about your definition of ego, how it can be a benefit and how, um, and what its purpose is, I guess you have a beautiful way of describing the ego. So I'm going to let you do it. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, so the thing about the ego is yes, there is this perception of like, you know, oh, he's so he's got a big ego or, you know, and, and I get that part. Um, but I also think when you said it, you know, like the puffed up chest, it actually made me think about something that I'd never thought about before. It's like, it is really a puffed up chest because the ego is really protecting our heart. 
right? And so that's really what it is, is like this mm. puffed up, mm. right? It's like, this is, this is like a way that's like, well, I have to, you know, what, whatever your version is. So the person who's called, who has the big ego, they've puffed, they've protected their heart by puffing it up and making a big guard around it of a mask of being like the best, the being the, you know, being this like, you know, good, awesome. Like I'm like the best at things and I'm the smartest and the most capable. That's just one of the many ways that the ego can manifest. But I think it is about, we do. I, and I'm laughing kind of going like, yeah, it's like armor, right? Puff, puffing up the chest and armoring up our heart. And That's so, so true. I, yeah, so I never thought about that before, but so from my point of view, I look at the ego as, um, as you said earlier, it's just a part of us. It's another part of us, right? But um, it's so funny. I wonder if you'd be willing to share with me, because I can go in multiple directions, but I, I get the feeling that there's something about the way I describe the ego that you really liked that I'd love to know if you even just got me a little started with it, just so I can make sure that I'm going down the path that feels resonant. Yeah, just talking about it being our inner protector and how, oh, yeah. okay. um, and, and how it works with our inner child. Oh yeah. Oh, I know. Cause it's the sweetest thing, right? So our ego is, is yes. So when every single human comes into being a human, we have this ego and it is, it gets formed probably um, in these, let me, let me just say this. Everyone, everyone has to have an ego because everyone is a human and every human is, has a mission to survive. Okay. And that's what, if you are here right now, it is because your ancestors had an amazing ego defense mechanism, this ability to be able to like sense danger and be able to protect themselves. Let's just picture way, way long time, time ago in like physical ways, whether that be animals or whether that be you know, war situations or whatever the situations are, they have a a well-honed survival mechanism. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. The thing that's happened over the years though, is that we have become safer and safer as a species. We don't have the same circumstances that we're, most of us don't. I would say like most of your listeners probably don't have circumstances where their survival is at risk. So what's happened though, is our, our inner protector, our ego defense mechanism has gone a little bit more like a little awry in that, like I say, she, I think you're most of your audience is most of your mm-hmm. audience women. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they identify as women. So I, I say um, she, she, our little inner protector, um, she now is seeing all kinds of things that are psychologically and emotionally scary. And she comes in and she wants to protect us. So let's go to the place of the inner protector. So inner protector equals ego defense mechanism in my mind. And I like to think of her that way because it makes me feel like I can have more compassion for her and love her. And I see her as something different. Like like I see her as something that's like, I see her as a part of me. Inner protector is a part of me. And then when I think about inner child, right? So I think of inner child as the part of me that was like, I don't know, it could be anything, could be like the joyful, playful parts of me. It could be the wounded parts of me. It could be, um, you know, it's so many aspects of us, but let's just go to the wounded part for the moment right now. So as we're children, right, things happen. People miss the mark with us. They miss a tune. They say the wrong things. They hurt us. They just don't- like we do with our kids. Like, just like we do everyone sidebar. Like we do that with our kids in once you become aware of this, then it's like, oh, how do I not do it? But no matter what you do, it's going to happen. And right, wrong, or indifferent, like it's just what it is. Totally. And and I'll throw in a couple things. Of course, if we know better, we'll do better. Of course, as we heal, we will do it less because we will have more capacity to be able to see our child's and their and their feel. You know, we won't have as many barriers up, so we'll be able to feel them more. There's no question. But there are no fully conscious people. Like, I mean, I I maybe, maybe like Buddha, maybe, I don't know, but like we're most of us aren't fully conscious. So that means that we're going to do unconscious things and we're going to unconsciously hurt other people, children included. And that's what happened with our parents. And that's kind of the cycle of where we are. And we can all just do the best we can. Um, So we get hurt. We get, you know, we get wounded and we get, 
anything from big T traumas, right? Like real things that like people call trauma, but all these little mini micro attachment traumas happen. Relational traumas happen to us. So what happens? What do we learn? We learn ways to cope. We learn ways to be able to not have to feel that pain of what are the humiliation of being yelled at. Okay. I'm never going to get yelled at again. I will do, I will do it perfectly. I will always do it perfectly. I will do that. Um, the feeling of mom's disappointment and that just cuts to the core. I don't ever want to feel that. So I'm going to anticipate her needs and I'm going to do whatever it is that needs to be done around the house. I'm going to be like, maybe not even like Maybe not even like, oh, I cooked or that, but just even like subtle things. I don't want to upset mom. I do the right thing. I I don't ever, you know, get into trouble. I get good grades. You know, I don't like the feeling of my parents' disappointment. I better get all A's. So instead of learning how to feel our feelings, we learned how to cope with all those painful feelings. And we put these layers on. So we put the armor, we put the mask, the mask of being the great A, the great A student and the person who's the good friend and whatever. And we put all these masks on and all of these are inner protector tools, kind of like they're all like strategies. And what are they there to do is to protect the inner child. The inner child is, the inner child was like, I don't like all the, like she, she was like, that hurt, that hurt, that hurt, that hurt, that hurt. Inner protector come, rises up and is like, okay, I have a good way to never have to have you feel that feeling. Let's do this. It's all happening <laughs> unconsciously. Right? Or none, of us, none of us are thinking about this stuff. And I use, I've joked around before. I say to myself, I am so, I, I thank my inner protector all the time for creating such pro-social coping mechanisms because some people create coping mechanisms that are really destructive to their lives. Being an overfunctioner and an overdoer and a person who you know needs to get it right and all this stuff has created massive amounts of success for me and probably many many people in your life. I'm I feel like it made, it's made me a better mother, better like this and that. I have a list of things. Absolutely. I have gratitude that I that my unconscious mind chose these amazing coping mechanisms. <laughs> it's so true because it could it easily go the other way. And then you choose these other coping mechanisms and it's the same element of your yourself trying to protect you, trying to keep you safe, but maybe more in more visible, unhealthy ways. Yes. Eating, drugs, alcohol, totally. abuse, whatever it may be. Yep. Yep. Even um, apathy. Yeah. You know, even incompetence, like a mask of incompetence, like, and can make it be like, you know, they never, we never really get to the place where we, so one of the things that happens in our lives is that we build a certain level of safety and security, right? So if you have healthy coping mechanisms, you might like, you might have been able to earn money, find a partner who has some reasonable level of success in the world too. So you guys, you know, you can, you can get a home and you can, rate, you know, have children, these things happen. And so we create a foundation for ourselves of some level of safety and stability and security. I mean, sort of, but yes. Um, And that allows us to be able to start to do this type of inner work, right? Because it's like, if you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs is one of them where you have to have your basic needs met in order to be able to get up to like self-esteem and self-realization, right? I don't know if, um, that's a familiar thing for people, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then also I've shared with you, you know, we talk about this in the program about Carl Jung talks about first half of life living and second half of life living. So in your first Mm -hmm. half, it is more ego driven. You are more driven by your inner protector. You are more driven by those, these patterns and strategies. And that's not necessarily bad. That is gets you to a certain point. But then there's another, another point where all of a sudden you're like this, why am I not happy? Why am I why do I have everything that I thought that I wanted, but I'm not even happy with my life? What's going on with me? Why am I yelling at my children? Or why am I totally critical of my husband? Why am I doing it all that I'm resentful and bitter? And that's the wake up moment for us, right? That's that time when we're getting like, where our inner protector is like, no longer her strategies are like outdated. Her strategies are no longer mm. useful for us. Her strategies have now shift, they've shifted from, protecting and keeping us safe to actually hurting us in some ways. 
to, yeah, it's like you and, and by you kind of waking up to it, it's like, you're beginning to say, ah, I am smarter than you. And I can outsmart you. I can, I, I don't have to do this anymore. Exactly. Like I'm onto you, you know, I'm onto you and I, and you know, I like to use thoughts of, in terms of like, like, I love you and I appreciate you. Like our ego is one is definitely to be thanked because yeah. we may not have made it through those childhood circumstances for one. And it, she is in the highest service to us all the time. However, she also is what keeps us from being connected to our inner child. And what's the deepest longing is for us to connect to ourselves. And so she becomes almost like there's like a, like if I can imagine, because I, I know that this is um, audio is like, if you had, I even just imagine just in your house, right? You have a wall and two rooms and your inner child is in, in one room and your adult you is in another room and there's a wall in between. And that wall is your inner protector because she's not only keeping you from the world, she's the inner protector is not only protecting the inner child from the world, but in some ways she's kind of protecting, protecting her from you because you don't want to feel her. You're not, you're, yeah. you know, you're like, I don't want to feel those uncomfortable feelings. I don't want to go into that. So that, that inner protector, she serves many purposes, but there's a certain point where it's like, no, I, I, I we can't do that anymore. We're brave. It's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A great metaphor. So I think in my initial thoughts on this, when we started talking about this was, you know, how we as do it all women, people or over functioners. Now, if you're not familiar with over functioning, which some people might not be familiar with that term, but it's when you basically feel the need to do things for everybody else, to do all the things, to, to maintain that control instead of trusting, instead of allowing others to live, learn, make their own mistakes and figure out their own way. Over functioning just puts all that together in one term. But when we start to examine that, when we start to examine that, um, that could potentially be negatively impacting our lives, because if you're not aware of it, like you could just go on thinking, oh, this is what I have to do. And I've got to do this for my kids and make sure that they're here and make sure that they're there. And my husband won't do it. So I've just got to do it. And like you said, that starts to breed these feelings of resentment and feelings of eventually that resentment turning into contempt. And like, it's basically a recipe for it's not going to work out with whatever, with whomever it is. When you start to feel those feelings of contempt, it's like, that's the worst of the worst, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there's a way out. We're not going to talk is. about that today, but when you have that quality inside of you, it's not always bad, but it's generally because of these um, masks or blockages that we put up. It's because of the um, unmet childhood needs, the inner child that hasn't been recognized. And often I like to think of that one, especially with over-functioning people is that we just feel like we're not enough. And that is such a huge, strong feeling. And I think that goes for like almost everybody there. We always have, I don't want to say we always, because I don't know, there could be people out there who just absolutely feel like they're enough. But I think for the most part, a lot of, especially if you're an overfunctioner, you just feel like you're not enough. And that's why you're trying to do to, to cover up that feeling of not being enough. And then this ego defense mechanism that just swoops in and, and tries to rescue. And it's like those three elements, the masks, the inner child or the unmet childhood needs and the ego that kind of work together in tandem to keep us safe and to push us towards always doing more, always doing more. Yeah. Yeah. One thing about that is that um the the there are people who also have like kind of a funny thing. There's like we can be also afraid we're too much. So I'm going to give you another just a nuance to the the two and I think they're the say they're two sides of the same coin. And by the way, a lot of people don't even recognize they're not enough not enoughness because they do do so much that they actually do feel 
like, uh, what are you talking about? I'm, en- I'm enough. I do everything. But they're tell not you what I was there probably 10 years ago. That's exactly where it was. Like I thought, eh, right. I'm totally enough. Like I, yeah. Like that wasn't even a blip on my radar. Exactly. Cause, cause often we have to look at the coping mechanisms that we use to find the underlying beliefs and fears. So oftentimes the overfunctioner thinks this is just who I am. I'm just good at getting things done. But if you look at it as a coping mechanism, you start going, Oh, what could be happening here? So the, the ones that I see are not enough, which is some, at some level, they learn that they have to hustle to prove their worth that they're not just worthy, that they have to prove it, that they have to prove they're valuable all the time. And on the side of the too much person, um, and that would be me, I'm raising my hand, is that I had to prove that because I'm so hard to handle, because I'm so much the problem, I'm so difficult, I better give a lot to everybody. So that I'm, so that I'm not a burden so that I'm like, I, you know, if I'm, if I do, if I do above and beyond for everyone, then they're going to keep me around because at least I've done, look at how much I've done for them. So even though all these things about me are burden and difficult and a problem, if I do enough, they'll still love me. What do you think? How do you think you you can be both? Like, I feel like I have both of the, like, I, I feel like. I had those thoughts of like, I'm too much. I remember having those thoughts in elementary school and like, "Mm, then I'm just going to stop raising my hand. I guess I'll stop answering. Like if I'm the one who was always answering and like, I can tell that, you know, then I'm, I'm just going to stop answering. I'm going to stop feeling like I know, or like, I don't know, but I just, I'm going to give it a shot. And yeah, you play a little smaller, you start uh-huh. to clean yourself a little, you fit into what is the, the, the other people yeah. are even energetically, you were picking up on, oh, oh, I just felt yeah. judgment from somebody or whatever. Yeah. So that was when you were feeling like you were too much, but then there are ways that you're also saying that you feel like there, you're not enough. You saw like, yes. where you, you missed the mark or you're not. And gosh, it, this, like, I'm having a moment where I'm realizing I went to a very small school. Like I had 28 kids in my graduating class. We were a small school. Um, But I remember also thinking like that I just didn't fit in there at my school. And like, I was too much or I was, that's, that's the only thing that's coming to me right now, but it was, I didn't fit in and I didn't, I mean, I had my friends there and everything and that was fine, but it was, um, yeah. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I hear, so I went someplace else and I like met people in other towns and I hung out with, I had friends in other towns and I had, and I know that I got judged so much for that. Yeah. I hear it all the time. I think women really, I think secretly women are really struggling even in that department too, of the friendships and not being enough and, or being too much and not knowing how to navigate it. And the way we navigate it that is actually by being our authentic self, but that's just such not, that's so, that's so big. Right. But that's how we navigate mm-hmm. it is by, by being that by, you know, creating enough inner safety that we can finally be our true selves in the world. But most of us, what we are doing is straddling and not enough too much. I think that it's not, I think what you said is very common and we're straddling the not enough too much all the time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's beautiful insight. And so we try to cope and we try to show that we are worthy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people love this about us. People love our ability to do a lot. You know, they love it. And they also, it also does you know, it's funny. Does it rob people of their, um, like when I think about, you said something before we were talking about energy, we're talking about energy and how, you know, if I change, if I change something in me, like if I, if I have, if I have a judgment of you, you might pick up on my judgment. Right. And then that might literally, I, you change because I'm judging you now, all of a sudden you feel judgment and you feel a little insecure. Right. And you're, you're a little bit like, Um, they've actually shown that if you, 
If you sit and listen to a person with unconditional positive regard, they will be smarter and say more awesome things. But if you sit in with a person with judgmental energy, they will start to sound more like incompetent and capable. They'll start to bumble and fumble over their words more. And so that if you, it, it's so that's why we know the energy really matters, but on the over-functioning and under-functioning side of things, there's a, there's the same thing there that um, very few under-functioners are going to actually start stepping up and doing more in the relationship because there's not that much incentive because they kind of, they kind of secretly (laughs) like that you do everything from on a, on a day-to-day basis. They're like, this is awesome. They get it all done. Why would I want to step up and do it? And they also usually get criticized for not doing it right. So they're like, I think I'll just not do that. But, (laughs) but at some level, they're being robbed of being a whole person because we are doing more than a hundred percent of our own. We're, we're taking more than a hundred percent responsibility. Anything about that each person has a hundred percent responsibility, right? We're usually crossing over into their territory and overdoing. So um, if we want to shift a dynamic in our lives, oftentimes it's, we think the, we're always looking to the other person to change. Why don't they do more? Why won't they offer to help? Why won't they plan the birthday party? Why don't they do that? But the the reason actually is because, um, well, first of all, whoever doesn't like it is the one that usually has to change it first, right? So if we're sick and tired of it, we're the ones that have to change it. But also- And I'm just going to insert that it's mostly the ladies who who realize this or who have to, because it's not very often that a man is going to realize that and say, I'm going to change that, or I'm going to make an effort to change that in my marriage or in my life. Right. There's not much incentive for them because on a day-to-day basis, they benefit from it drastically. But when we, but if we can start to change it and we start to stand in our power more and we start to recognize why we do what we do and say, wait a second, maybe I, maybe I am okay as I am. Maybe I don't need to do as much as I do. Maybe I can sit with the discomfort, my own discomfort of not having everything done perfectly And as we do more of that and we dial back a little bit, we realize that, oh, the family doesn't fall apart. You know, we, we are actually doing okay, even with me doing a little less. And then, and then the dynamic starts to shift. And as we take on not as much responsibility, the other person starts to come in and take on a little bit more. Um, So that's why doing this work, like, this is why when I say like, it's not so simple just to say like, oh, auth- when you're just your authentic self, it's all going to be better because it's, it's like that, that is like many steps of, well, why do I wear this mask of, of, you know, over-functioning? Why do I, oh, why do I do all of this? And then we have to come in and meet the inner protector. Oh, thank you so much for all the ways that you have protected me over these years. I appreciate you deeply. And did you know that I'm an adult? <laughs> Did you know that I'm an adult now? Like we might be able to choose a different way here, possibly the way of genuinely believing that we don't have to hustle for our worth anymore. And then that's a journey, right? And that's a journey. But as we start to do that, then what do we do? Oh, maybe I don't have to compensate all the time. Maybe I don't have to cope using this method and all the time anymore. And we get to dial back a little bit more, a little bit more. And I know you're going to think, everyone's going to be like, yeah, that won't make a difference. My husband won't do anything, but it does. It's like, a, it's a law of the universe almost like that, you know, polarities attract. And then when you're more in the middle, you attract someone who's more in the middle. And that's just what happens. So you'll, you'll, he'll it's be absolutely wrong. true. Now there are things that have to come into play too. Like you have to start communicating your needs and like, you have to start communicating that stuff as well and start, I love the the analogy of just having a drop of underfunctioning, <laughs> just a drop of underfunctioning. And what would that look like? Even with your kids, not necessarily even just with your husband, but like doing all the things for your kids is yeah. insane. And it's, you know, I, I don't know. I would made a comment yesterday even, and I caught myself in it, but it was like, I don't even remember what was going on, but it was, I, oh, this, it was all the snow stuff by the by the door and like the area yeah. where the kids hang their coats and they had been playing outside numerous times yesterday, their snow boots, their wet stuff. Like I was like, ah, oh, like this stuff, it can't even get hung up. Like it, it needs to be hung up so it can dry. And then I'm like, wait a second, this is only making me uncomfortable. That 
it's not making any of them uncomfortable. Like I don't have to do all of this. If they don't want their stuff dried, it's not going to get dried then. Like that's fine. It's not, it's only making me uncomfortable that I can't walk through the laundry room to get to the garage because all their stuff is laying all over, you know, like I will deal with it. That's huge. So wait, so what did you do? You went to, you tended to your own uncomfortable feelings. Uh huh. And then awesome. I, I, well, I went and I sat back down with what I was doing. Cause I had helped one outside and anyway, sat back down and was like, hold on. Like I can be in this uncomfortableness and be with the, the entryway being filled with snow gear and stuff wet. They're just going to be disappointed when they get back, when they go to go back outside and it's wet. Yeah. Well, that's okay. No, you could look at that as like, you're super uncaring. You didn't even take care of your kid's stuff. But like, also I do it for them. And I do it for, if I do it for them every time, are they going to learn? Are they going to learn that they have to also take ownership in their life and they're old enough to know, and they've done this enough times that you put your stuff in front of the vent, it'll dry. You hang it up. So it's not all bunched up. It'll dry. They've been around the block a few times. They know. Absolutely. And that is where, when I said, let's say we rob our, we rob another person of their, their own experience of becoming a whole human because we're in their business on things. And I mean, yeah, you're right. Like if, if we're talking about like people who aren't capable of doing it for themselves, that's, that's understandable. Yes. But they are perfectly capable of doing this. So a person could say that that's somehow not caring, but if you look at what is our job, our goal is to raise adults, then it is the most caring thing you can do. And, but the key for that I want to point out is that you had to increase your tolerance for your own distressing and uncomfortable feelings. That's what the, that's the magic is that yeah. it's like, we're the ones that usually do things because we don't like the feeling of whatever it is the mess, the feeling of that I should be a good mother, a good mother would clean this stuff up or the kids should do this, whatever our stories are around it, all that stuff. And you said, wait a second. No, actually, I just have feelings in here and I'm actually going to. Exactly. Face the that was only one time yesterday. It happened to me also when anytime my husband has a day off, he takes a nap. Like he goes into the bedroom, shuts the door, takes a nap. And I don't know why, but it drives me bonkers. Partly also because he was leaving yesterday afternoon to go out of town for the week. And I was like, and it didn't occur to me until he was getting ready to walk out the door. And I was like, I needed connection. I wanted connection with you because I know you're going to be gone all week. And like you going and shutting the door was literally like, I'm going to abandon my family for the next two hours while I nap because the three-year-old's napping. And, you know, like that was, but when he went in there, my initial, I sat down and I was like, oh, it's like, I'm really uncomfortable right now. Like really uncomfortable. I can be uncomfortable though. I can be uncomfortable and start to work through these feelings. And I did, I tapped into some other feelings and emotions, but it wasn't until he got ready to leave that I realized the uncomfortableness was because I also wanted that connection or I needed that connection from him knowing that he's going to be gone for a week. So for you, you have a, what was the feeling that you said that you have when he lays down for a nap? What was the, what uh, did you say? is it anger or is it uh, just super frustrated? I don't know. What was that feeling? I like when he lays down, I'm just like, are you serious? Like, it is anger. Like, I'm, I'm like, why, why do you need to take a nap every day? Yeah. You're an adult person. You have to take a nap every day for the, when you're, when you don't work, I don't know. Have you ever heard the saying that anger is sad's bodyguard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the, Cause to me, this is where we get tripped up a lot of times because people yeah. will often say, I feel my feelings. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. And I'm like, yes, but those are all like, what's the word? Like secondary emotions, I think is what they call yeah. it. It's, a, it's like the more, those are the, those are the things that you use to cope. And so yeah. for you now, you know, it's like we use the word, it's, as you know, in the program, a trailhead, a trailhead to yourself, your, your anger is a trailhead for you. Oh, mine too. So anger for me was always a trailhead. I knew that that wasn't the, that wasn't the end game. There was something yeah. underneath that. Oh, connection. Oh, injustice. 
Oh, you know, yeah. something, right? Oh, I, I'm, I just got my boundaries trampled. Holy crap. Like I, I didn't say something. And so, so even feelings can be coping mechanisms because we're like, I'm, I'm allowed to feel anger. Now, a lot of other people might identify with, I'll never feel anger, right? We know that that's another yeah. thing. It's, it's sad is their first feeling. I felt this kind of like, ugh, like, ugh, why is he going to do that? Why is he taking a nap? Like, like we literally now have quiet time without the three-year-old running around where we could connect and he, but I didn't express that need to him. I didn't even, so that's, that's on me also. But when I sat down, I realized that yeah. I was, I was sad because I thought, Oh, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. And this is my time. But so then I thought, well, I will connect with myself. And that's what I did for the next hour, hour and a half was just connected with myself and, and did some other self-work, but it was the lonely. It was the sad. It was feeling that I needed to connect. And rightfully so, like I can connect with myself so much to a certain point. And then also I want to connect with my, with my husband, especially when he's going to be gone. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it sounds like a a great thing that you did because that's one of the other things too, is that we can't, Oh, another person's not always going to be able to do, you know, do the right thing or be there the way that we need them to be or whatever. So you went to who you do know you can trust as yourself. You know, you've built that trust with yourself that you're like, oh, I know that I can turn to me. I could fill my cup. Yeah. You know? And yeah. it is nice not to feel like we have to have another person to do that. They become icing yeah. up a little bit more for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, Deb. We've talked about a lot of stuff today. Mm-hmm. I'm going to finish up with a couple questions. The last two questions that I typically ask people and um, yeah, these can be as lighthearted or as serious as you choose. And um, so tell us out of all that you do, out of all that we've talked about, how does this cultivate a greater health, harmony, and happiness in your life? Well, I feel like it's the path to it. And I don't mean the whole soul way is the path to it, but the path that we get on, which is to shift away from ego consciousness to, I don't know what the right word is for. Is it, you know, divine union? Is it, you know, Christ consciousness? I don't know what it is, but some, that path, I think that is the path. So, and I think that's the path to, you know, definitely health, harmony, and happiness. Um, Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I would just say, I will speak to each one. Like, so for health, I really believe, um, and, and I, I know there's a physical element to it. I'm not denying that, but I really do believe that so much of our health is rooted in, you know, removing energetic blockages and feeling like we're whole in, in like facing, you know, stuck energies, dealing with our traumas, processing, metabolizing feelings, you know, all of that. So I feel like the health is absolutely inter connected to so physical health is interconnected, emotional, psychological, and all that. Um, harmony. Well, so mm, is harmony, harmony kind of is like, I think of harmony a little bit like wholeness and integration and balance. And I think what we're usually dealing with is a lot of fragmentation. Like, you know, I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that rejecting this, rejecting that resisting life, resisting everything. Right. And so that causes tremendous suffering. So the more that we say every every part of me is welcome. Every feeling is welcome. You know, I don't have to make you a different person in order for me to be okay. All of that we come into harmony. So I feel like harmony is definitely there. And then happiness is a funny word. It's a funny word because we all want happiness, but nobody knows how the heck to even like really even describe it. But there's something we all know that we all want, which is called happiness. And I think mm-hmm. that happiness comes from a sense that we are not Mm. I think first of all, happiness comes from the inside out. And I think that it doesn't mean that you're not experiencing. There are lots of things I do that make me happy. I mean, even just like drinking a latte can make me happy or something like that, right? There are lots right. of things that make me happy. Um, but there, but if I'm not happy inside, then it's not going to really be persisting. And I think that's why people really want this sense of happiness. Something that's like, not that I'm like walking around smiling and like happy all the time, but like, I just feel, I feel happy. Right. It's, it's a feeling of contentment, a feeling of 
and and that's kind of how I I describe it too is this this feeling of contentment with the present moment. You just and knowing it. that I mean it can change, but your happiness is contentment with the present moment. We're not always going to have it. N- definitely not. That's not the goal. Like it's going to come and go. We have all these other things going on in us. Like I think of the, you know, the movie inside out yeah. and all the other things are going on too. But if right. we can seek to come back to that place of contentment and being present with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's something in there about, um, I do think that the more that we work through all of these things, all the turbulence inside of us and every one of those gets seen, the less turbulence we experience inside because most of the turbulence we experience is because it's stuff that's been unprocessed. Right. And so the more we face it and we feel it and we let it move through us. And I was reading, um, I can never say this, right. But the, I think I might have it is the Bhagavad Gita. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I'm reading a commentary on it right now. And the idea is that how do we stay? Like, how do we have equanimity, right? Where we stay the same, whether we're in profit or loss or whether we're in, you know, um, whatever, like what's pleasure or pain so that we're able to say, oh, you know what? I just had this really horrible thing happen to me, like this thing, whatever I just found out I have, but you know, an illness or something, how do I come back to like, okay, like, you know, I'm not going to be completely thrown off or I get it. Re- really mean comment on Facebook. And then I also get this compliment and one makes me feel good. And one makes me feel bad. Like, how do we get to the place where it's like, neither are really making us, you know, go into that turbulence. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I think. And I really believe the, that this work, you know, is that my, the work that I do internally, I feel like I have more persistent happiness instead of my mask of happiness, which I've always yeah, had. Yeah. You know, For I've always sure. had mask of happiness. For sure. It's, it's the uh, surrendering to the natural flow of events and, beautiful. and being okay with it. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. Not always easy, as you said, but I think it's like a, it's a, it's the, it, I do at, in the shower this morning, I thought, I do think that we do get closer and closer. People sometimes say to me, is it ever really going to be? And I'm like, yeah, I actually do think we do get more health, harmony and happiness on the journey. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely do. I, and, oh yeah. That takes me down another thought path is that the number of times that people have asked. And I think I even talked to someone, I did an interview long ago on this about how, can we feel better as we age? You know, and I have been the first to say, and always my students have heard me say this a number of times is that age is just a number. Age is just a number. And I fully believe that. Like I feel as good as I did when I was 18, as good as I did when I was like, I just turned 41 yet. I'm still moving my body and feeling as good as I did when I was a teenager or in my twenties. I think that's pretty fantastic. I think it's how we choose to live our lives and how we choose to perceive things that allows us to believe that or allows us to, to continue to move forward in the health, harmony, and happiness. Yeah. Yeah. I think you nailed it. And I, I love that you brought up the perceived things. Cause I think that's important, but you know, I mean, I'm, so I'm 52 and, um, it's definitely, I have always felt that way. And it's also, it's interesting. It is an interesting journey. I think mm-hmm. 50 has been a big milestone, <laughs> but I totally believe we, I absolutely agree with you on it. And it's, it's been fodder for my growth too. You know, watching, watching my skin change, watching my body not be able to make build muscle as easily. It's a, it's fodder for my growth. Yeah, it is exactly. And isn't it amazing? Like it gives us, um, gives us other things to appreciate or gives us another perspective or another way to look at like, wow, this is really cool, but I wouldn't have this if I didn't, hadn't been here, if I hadn't done that, or if I hadn't spend too much time in the sun. I wouldn't have these spots or whatever, you know, like, I don't know, it all fits together and it's all. And that's, I guess how I try to look at my life is that like all these scars, all these things that I have, they're all because of the life that I have lived 
Yeah. Yeah. The warrior in you. I totally yeah. agree. And I yeah. also will say there is one other thing too, which is that there, I read this or heard this person talking about this. And I thought it was really beautiful, which is that because the first half of your life is like, what is my, what does the world want from me? And it's a lot about doing and getting out there and success and all that. And the second half of your life is really, what does my soul want from me? That's, that's according to, you know, like Jungian thinking, yeah. um, Carl Jung. And the idea is that your body does start to become, it changes and you know, and you don't use your body in the same way. Like your body isn't the, isn't as necessary for all those things because you're shifting into really an inner, the, the ideal, I think is that we shift to more of cultivating our inner landscape. So, you know, we're focused more on the external for those first half of our life. And then we start to turn, like, I can look at myself and be like, it's not, I can't, can't think that I'm always going to look the same, right? That's just natural. You're going to change. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, my goals, like, and I'm sure, as I'm sure yours have too, like your goals for, for maintaining a healthy body have completely shifted or have changed as you have changed and aged and grown. And, you know, like the image that I continue to have, I've got it on a vision board here by my desk too, of like, I, I had to do this vision board of like past, present, and future. And, um, in my future, I've got this image of this woman doing yoga. She's clearly in her seventies or eighties, and she's just embodying this, this peacefulness and this calm. And she's doing a very challenging posture, but like she's embodying this, this calm about her. And that's just the coolest thing. And that's where I can see, Oh yeah, 20 years ago, that wasn't my, you know, like, no, I wanted to be the hard body. I wanted to be the person who, um, you know, could have done fitness shoots or, you know, like I wanted to be that person. Yeah. I was proud of my muscles. I was proud of my strength. Yep. And now here I am, like my strength looks different. Yeah. Ah, yeah totally. It looks totally. different because of it's had to change. Yeah. And, perhaps- and it's a different kind of strength. It's an inner and outer strength now. Right. It's much more integrated and you know, it's so funny. I was the same way about my muscles and stuff too, but I, I am hypothesizing that for both of us, that was part of our armor too. Right. You know, yeah, like, for I sure. hard, I, I'm like harder and we're softening, we're softening kind of if from the inside out. And so it's okay to not have the same level of muscle, the same type of muscle, and you could still be strong and you could still be but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a softer strength, right? So, yep. I'm totally, it's a, it adds it a, I'm really appreciating. That is a big takeaway that I want to, you know, take from this conversation is just the reminder that, um, my body, you know, our bodies are always changing and that our, we get to, and maybe they become more, maybe, be, maybe we become more integrated, right? Like our inner experience represents our outer experience. And that softening and that yoga poses and the being like embodying inner peace. That sounds pretty dreamy to me. Yeah. So one of the things that came to me when you were talking just now is that like, I just did handstand scorpion this morning in my practice. And like my practice has not been very great over the past few months. Like I've been going through, I've been going through mental, emotional stuff. So it comes out in your physical body, right? Today, I felt phenomenal. And I did handstand scorpion. And when you were just talking, I was thinking, man, I want to be 52 and do handstand scorpion. Like I still want to be doing that in my practice. And if you're not familiar with handstand scorpion, it's when you're doing a handstand and you bring your legs over your head. So your feet are moving towards touching your head, right? It's a super challenging posture. Backbends are my thing though. That's just a natural gift that I've been given handstands, not so easy, but they require a lot of other elements. They require focus. They require balance. They require this trust and this also playfulness and this, um, this ability to just have this confidence that, that you can do the hard things and do hard things while being adaptable. So (laughs) exactly, exactly. But I don't think a handstand scorpion hasn't felt that strong for me in months because I think I had to work through some of that emotional 
stuff. And it was the emotional stuff that was stopping me from actually achieving the physical. Wow. That's pretty powerful. I don't know. That's really powerful. Anyway. So love it. Cool. Okay. Second question. And we'll wrap this up and, and thank you so much for taking oh, so much of, so much of your time. Um, what's one thing you're doing right now to invite more intentional living into your life or more intention into your life? Hmm. Okay. Well, so one is that my son brought, bought me a book, which I have to say my 18 year old son bought me a book and it was called the five minute journal. And it was about my, and he's like, mom, I saw this and I knew it would be perfect for you because, and it's like in it, it actually does have a quote. And then it has, I think like what three things you're grateful for and what would make date today great. And I will tell you something. I have a hard time with the things about what would make today great. It's a, it's a new practice for me. So that is what I'm doing. That is about setting greater intention. I love it. Yeah. And I, I'm not, I don't know why it's so hard for me. Huh. It's very hard. So I, that's so interesting I bring more intention now to every day. Well, and maybe it has something to do with you wanting to remain present and just, um, not like think that far ahead or think like what could happen or what you just want to remain present in it could be part of it could also be that. Yeah. What could make today great? I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Why do you think it's challenging? Yeah. I think some of it is because I have gotten to the place where I do I follow my day more like fluidly. You just flow. Yeah. Like, so yeah, I think there's part of it is that But I also think that pleasure has always been a little bit of something that I've been, that I grapple with of like really allowing myself to have pleasure. So I've been trying to tap into like what little things would even just give me a little pleasure, like an extra boost of pleasure. So yeah, but it's, but I'm surprised at the thing. I'm, I'm surprised that that's the thing I could do gratitudes. No problem. My affirmation for the day, no problem but I have to sit and actually think about that. So I, and, and I come up with things, but I'm surprised that it's hard, that it's a little bit harder for me than I would have expect. When I read it, I was like, Oh, that's really cool. And then I go to do it. Mm. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, sometimes what if it's it's an in- like, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say like for today, I did say that, you know, that our, our um, podcast interview is in the highest service to, you know, to the listeners, that kind of thing. Like, so it's still my intention for the things that I'm doing, you know, the things that I know I'm doing. Yeah. I was going to say, what if it's just, um, a feeling you want to create or a, you know, the, the, how you want to be at the end of the day, how, how you want to feel complete at the end of the day and what could help you feel complete at the end of the day. Mm, I like that. I'm actually going to note that because I think that might be, like, yes, it's almost like instead of what would make the day great as far as what three things am I going to do? Yep. It's like, how do I, how do I want to be? Like, how do I want to yes. feel? Like yes. I would, you know, I would be connected to myself all day long. You know what I mean? That's or I would, you know, fully that- how I set intentions with people and how, like when I do intention setting rituals or meditations or classes, that's what I do with people. That's, that's the goal of the intention. It's not about the doing of the things and checking things off your list. It is the, um, what, what feeling, how do you want to be aligning with your highest good or what feeling or outcome do you want to create? And quite honestly, that's how my planner is set up. And that's, as I have a worksheet that I am creating also for people to use, because this is how I set my planner up. I have at the top of it, my intentions, um, so that I drop in every day and I just ask myself, what is it that I need most right now? Or what is it, what is it that I need most today? And then the first answer that comes to mind is what I put down for number one. It may seem unrelated to anything. And then I say, and what else? And I write the second intention, the second word that comes to mind and what else? And I write the second word and the, or the third word. And then when I go back and I look at those there is a way that they connect with everything that I'm doing, or there is a way that I can say, okay, so if the word that came to me was highest good, like, okay, how can I use that for what I'm doing today? How can I make that um, into 
alignment or how, how is that fit in with what I know I'm already have to do today? Hmm. Because your intentions aren't the to do's. Then I have a section after my intentions where I write my top three. And those are the top three things that uh, the do's, the the planning of the doing, yep. but it's just like when I break down the, the energetic rhythm cycle or the phases that we have, we have that intention setting phase. And that's just all about the feeling or the outcome that you want to create. The second phase is when you actually start doing that planning and like, how is today going to be great? What are the things that I'm going to check off my list mm -hmm. to do? And then mm -hmm. you get to take action and then you get to reflect on it with your gratitudes at the end of the day or all at right. the beginning of the day, you can do gratitudes whenever, but there you go. That was so helpful for me because I think I kind of, uh, I got a little lost in it because I think my mind went to trying to do it right and do it what they told me to do in the book, Yeah, no. You know, instead of finding my own. So thank you for the space here to talk about it and to know that that's really what I want to do is I like the question. What do I need to know? Is that what you said? What do I need to know? Um, what is it that I need most today? What is it that I need most? Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to work out. I'll let you know how that cool. Good. I look forward to hearing about it. I think that'll and be much Thank you for, sorry. I kind of dispute all of that on you, but that's like my jam. Like that's where I'm like, oh. this is how you set this up and this just works and you just do it that way. So anyway, yeah, that was really helpful. I love it. I, I don't know. it just goes to show you that we all are learning from each other and we all have like everybody brought a piece in. That's why, that's why it drives me so crazy that we feel like we're not good enough because yes. I'm like freaking like you are magnificent and you're, you're, you're here because you're supposed to be here and you're actually supposed to be exactly who you are. So let's find you underneath all the layers of conditioning and fear and armor and all that. Let's find you so you can shine and be your freaking brightest self because then we start to be able to benefit. We all, we all are, we all are like, like synergistic people in, in a play or something. And otherwise when we're trying to be like somebody else, or we're trying to hide ourselves or to play small or overcompensate, we're not, we're missing the mark and we can't connect for sure. So I, much freedom in finding your own self and finding your way back to yourself. So much freedom so much freedom and it's such a blessing for everyone. And it's really the place where we connect from. It's almost like, it you know, is. we can't really connect. You can't connect mask to mask. That's a superficial no. connection. But when we take off the masks and we get to that place of, of authenticity and, you know, vulnerability, but I don't necessarily mean like, you know, crying vulnerable vulnerability, but like, right. like being tr true to who are, who we are, that's where we connect. Right. You kind of tell that ego and like you've said numerous times, you just tell that ego to have a seat in the back seat or to jump yeah. in your backpack and come yep. along for the ride. But you get to be the one leading. You get to be the one making the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 All of that. So cool. <laughs> so um, cool. Oh, Deb, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been awesome. Okay, friends, as you heard Deb and I talking today, there are various reasons when we become adults that we think we need to do everything. But in all reality, there's a couple key elements that spur us to become these do-it-all humans. And these things are all very closely related. We touched on the masks and the blockages that we create from years of childhood conditioning, trauma, socialization, whatever those may be. Those become these do-it-all people who want to um, try to fill that void of connecting with ourselves with the outward expression of ourselves instead. It, it comes from unmet needs, unmet childhood needs, feeling like we're not enough or feeling like we're too much or maybe a combination of both. And finally, it's that ego defense mechanism that we put up not only to um, to get us to do things in life, but also as a protector. It is our inner protector. And Deb expressed all of that beautifully today. She has got a wonderful shadow work starter kit that she's offering up to you as a gift. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. 
Deb and I also talked a little bit there at the end about intention setting. And because we did, I'm going to link to the intention setting worksheet I use in any sort of meditation or workshop around intention settings. I also use it personally every month to set my intentions, believe it or not. And it's a great tool and a great resource for not only setting intentions, but also then reflecting throughout your cycle throughout the month, however you may look at it. It's a way that you can keep all of those intentions and all of those reflections in one space guided by journal prompts or guided by um, worksheet prompts. So that will all be included. And I will be back next week with episode 67. And until then, friends, helping you find the rhythms in all you do. Cheers to cultivating your own version of health, harmony, and happiness in your life.